Um, and thanks to the organizers of the um, LinksNIST webinar on antibodies in solution for giving me a chance to talk about my favorite pet project, um, antibodies, and how to um, understand them using colloid models. Um, we have actually been interested in concentrated proteins for a long time, initially driven by our interest in understanding the islands and um, in particular also understanding protein condensation diseases around this like cataract formation, for example, or impaired vision like uh, presbyopia, uh, but also more in more general terms, uh, understanding protein crowding and the stability of the cytosol. And accordingly, also the, our, our prime interest initially was mainly on, on protein aggregation, protein phase separation, stability of protein solutions and mixtures and so forth. But then later on moved very much towards dynamics, um, in particular also of um, a more newer interest and, and that has to do with the formulation um, of biologics um, involving um, high concentration protein solutions. Now, this is in particular, this is of course also the focus of, of today's webinar. This has come from, from the fact that when wants to uh, formulate um, um, antibodies, one actually faces a few um, problems. Um, and this is, has to do with the fact that antibodies are very large proteins, um, typically around 150,000 um, molecular weight. But they only uh, only a small fraction of this protein is really the active site that is targeting then um, uh, sort of the the uh, structure of interest for the pharmacological uh, uh, treatment. And so we need relatively large doses of antibodies to administer something like a milligram of antibody per kilogram of patient. Um, and Obviously, currently, um, I mean, we all know how important antibodies have become in, in pharmaceutical industry. But they're primarily uh, administered um, uh, in the hospital um, by, by IV intravenous. Um, and what would, however, be preferred is, of course, if, one, if the patients could self-administer um, these drugs, for example, through a subcutaneous injection. Now, given the fact that we only can inject a, a limited volume, this means that we have to have high concentration formulations, typically above 100 milligram per milliliter uh, antibody concentration. And that, of course, then again raises problems because of the, uh, something that one often finds, and that is the increase of viscosity in protein solutions if one uh, increases the concentration. Now, there is something like uh, a window of opportunity here if the, if the relative viscosity, the ratio between the zero shear viscosity and, and the viscosity of the solvent goes above something like a factor of 10, injection becomes very difficult and painful. And so one needs to create formulations with antibodies that, that uh, where the viscosity even at the high concentration formulation is below this critical threshold. And as you can see in this particular example of an antibody that can, for example, then strongly depend uh, on parameters such as, for example, the ionic strings or the pH. And so we, we really need to understand and better even predict the viscosity of concentrated antibody solutions as a function of the molecular structure of the antibody and the other formulation conditions and physical parameters. Now, there is obviously a link between the molecular structure and the interaction potential between antibodies in solution. And there is also presumably a link between a tendency of antibodies to self-assemble and the resulting viscosity then of, of the antibody in solution at higher concentrations, which we need to understand. Now, there are, of course, ideas about around um, drawing analogies from colloids why the viscosity increases with antibody concentration. If we typically look into colloidal systems, say hard sphere particles in, 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 in a solvent, 
we see that with increasing volume fraction, initially the particles are able to undergo free diffusion. Once the volume fraction increases, um, particles around a particular particle or target particle then form, sort of form something like a cage where the particle now is no longer to diffuse freely, but will initially bounce around within the cage until it opens and the particle can escape. And once the concentration and the volume fraction is too high, and for hard sphere colloids, this is uh, close to random close packing, so close to about 64% volume fraction, typically a bit lower, such cage openings no longer can happen, and, and basically the solution or the suspension arrests. And it was assumed that for proteins, similar mechanisms hold. And indeed, if we go for compact globular proteins that interact primarily via excluded volume interactions, indeed, we find exactly the kind of behavior uh, quantitatively reproduced by the relationship between the relative viscosity and the volume fraction as found uh, for heart spheres and predicted through so-called mode coupling theory. However, the situation for proteins is actually more complicated because proteins are, as, and, and this is something we will come back to uh, in a minute, are not really you know, like billiard balls. And, and so when we then look into um, different types of proteins, we realize, and here I, I just show information from a related uh, type of experiment, um, and that is uh, neutron spin echo experiments that allows us to measure the uh, collective diffusion coefficient at relatively um, local distances around the nearest neighbor distance between proteins at high concentrations. Um, and it's the short time collective diffusion coefficient. In this case, we, we indeed see dramatic differences between the diffusive behavior of different proteins. And also when you look at the dashed lines here that indicate the arrest transition as a function of you know, for the, at the given volume fraction here, you see that this actually shifts down to very low values below 0.3 or so for certain types of proteins. And these are in effect proteins that are known to interact not only through typical colloidal um, centrosymmetric simple interaction potentials, but they are known to also have attractive patches that result then in, in cluster formation, in transient cluster formations. And the idea then that allows us to qualitatively at least understand what's going on here is that clusters, open fractal clusters, as they typically form under these conditions, take up much more volume than the monomers themselves. And so you can still have these kind of aging effects and, and the rest transition, but now the clusters, these open clusters play the role of the colloids initially. And so what is important and is that uh, when we now go for different types of proteins and in particular antibodies, we need to understand what the relative mechanisms are that determine the viscosity for concentrated for example, antibody solutions. Now, before going into this, we need to think about how we characterize uh, the structural and dynamic properties of these antibody solutions. And what we typically do is a combination of different techniques. That's dynamic light scattering, static light scattering, small angle X-ray scattering, and microreology. When we want to derive models to understand the behavior of these proteins and analyze these the experimental results that come from these uh, from these techniques it's of course first of all important that we really understand what we measure and in the case of dynamic light scattering what we really look at is the dynamics of density fluctuations or concentration fluctuations of a wavelength given by 2 pi over the scattering vector at which we do this dynamic light scattering experiment Concentration fluctuations or the decay of concentration fluctuations is governed by a quantity um, uh, that is called the gradient diffusion coefficient. And it's really this quantity that in the limit 
of small angles, um, small uh, um, scattering vectors, and, um, and small protein dimensions is what we measure in light scattering. On the static light scattering side, what we what we look at is the magnitude of these density fluctuations at the same wavelength, um, and this is expressed or, or or governed by by the osmotic compressibility. Um, and when we then go to SACS instead of light scat static light scattering, of course now we go to to um, much larger Q vectors, so smaller structural link scales that we can investigate. And so we have to look at the scattering intensity as, 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 as coming from a combination of influence from the particle structure. So in this case, for example, the antibody structure or the protein structure more general and interparticle correlations that become more prominent at higher concentrations. And finally, in the microbiology experiment, which we prefer for protein solutions compared to a classical um, um, rheometry measurement, um, what we really measure here is the self-diffusion or mean square displacement of uh, uh, large tracer particles. Well, when I say large, there are a couple of hundred nanometers in diameter, so much larger than the characteristic length scale in the solution given by the proteins and their uh, interparticle distances. And so we can then look at the uh, protein solution as some sort of a bulk solvent. And, we, and the trace of self-diffusion then basically gives us access to the zero shear viscosity of this bulk solvent. Now, as I said, we now need to create models that allow us to interpret this data based on, for example, the molecular structure of the protein. And this protein, however, can also self-assemble. And so, and and you know, I apologize. For, for for the uh, the density of formula here, but we have to understand then uh, that in this case we have to consider a system where we might see actually a polydispersed solution of clusters that also in that that also interact via different interaction forces and and also indirect interactions caused by hydrodynamic interactions. And so what we then measure in the dynamic light scattering experiment is a so-called Z or intensity averaged parent uh, gradient diffusion coefficient that is given by the true diffusion coefficient and, and then for you know, spherical colloids, a high dynamic function H of Q and the direct structure factor S of Q, which is also measured in the SACS experiment. And in the static light scattering, we can measure something like an apparent weight average molecular weight. And the problem here is that we need models that uh, allow us to consistently incorporate both self-assembly, so particle size distributions, as well as interactions that are also influenced by the self-assembly uh, in order to then uh, arrive at a consistent uh, analysis uh, and interpretation of this data. And so this is really here um, uh, the, the important thing to consider, and this is what we need to keep in mind. So how do we do this? Well, in general, for you know, compact globular proteins, um, the use of colloid models has, has a long tradition and actually been uh, successively used in order to describe and also even predict phase behavior of, of protein solutions, um, phase separation, um, aggregation, uh, arrest transitions, and so forth. And typically um, what one does is instead of, of using um, you know the full molecular structure of the protein, or here also uh, seen as the as the as the full shape of of the hair. Um, we go to something like a spherical hair in the extreme case of a spherical colloid that interacts via a spherical isotropic interaction potential. Now, for some proteins, this may not be good enough, so we may have to incorporate some particle shape and an isotropy or also the, include the possibility for um, directed interactions, patchy interactions caused, for example, by hydrophobic patches or non-homogeneous distribution of charges. But we never try to use the full atomistic structure because, for example, doing um, 
computer simulations of, of highly concentrated protein solutions using an atomistic description of the protein would just be absolutely impossible because it's, it's way too costly in terms of the, the numerical effort that needs to be uh, uh, taken care of. And so the key questions when, when trying to attempt to use colloid models in order to analyze the experimental data then is what is the, the right level of coarse graining that is capable of uh, reproducing the concentration dependent properties. Um, and the importance of direct interactions and shape and interaction as an isotropy. Do we have to take this into account or can we get around with uh, simple spherical models and interaction potentials? Now, for antibodies, it's becoming even a bit more complicated because of this open Y-shaped structure of the antibody. And so again, we have to see whether we need to use the full hair uh, or, or, or whether we can get away with the spherical hair. And so there are different uh, you know, levels of course training described here on this, on this uh, uh, slide, where we start from the true molecular structure of the antibody that we can then, for example, use in, in something like MD simulations or so to gain information about the most probable conformation of the antibody and gain insight into the flexibility of the antibody and so forth. Typically, we will then make a coarse graining step and, and for example, uh, model each amino acid as a small sphere. And then we can then use this uh, using, for example, Monte Carlo simulations to gain insight into the charge as a function of pH, ionic strength, and so forth. That again is still highly demanding. Um, and so we might uh, need to make further coarse screening steps and they either go to a smaller number of beats, uh, but, but still maintaining the Y-shaped um, uh, structure of the antibody or go to a full spherical antibody description. So the analogon of the spherical hair here. And it's really this kind of model that is typically used by many of the researchers interested in antibody uh, solutions and their characterization. And, description um, um, and uh, it's used to interpret, for example, um, theta potential measurements or scattering experiments, both dynamic and, and static uh, scattering experiments. And so let's start with this very simple colloid approach and see how far we get. For this, we take a first example of an antibody. It's a so-called IgG1. Um, typical molecule weight of about 148,000 uh, uh, Dalton. Uh, it, it comes with a high dynamic radius of uh, about five and a half nanometers, radius of charation of about five nanometers. And it's, it's strongly positively charged uh, with a charge, net charge of about plus 30. Now, if we make such a spherical colloid model, we take a particle that would then be modeled like a, a, a non-conducting sphere uh, with a given radius or say, call it the hard sphere radius. Um, and the interaction potential of that would then be a, a combination of the hard sphere potential, a screen coulomb potential and some short range attractive potential uh, that is typically then taking into account things like van der Waals attractions and possibly also some hydrophobic attraction. And that's really the kind of classic colloid potential that people then use also in, in the protein business. Now, th there's one thing that is often forgotten about and not taken into account, and that is uh, when we look at the screen Coulomb potential um, that describes the effect of the charges uh, in the presence of ions, counter ions, um, uh, one often forgets to take into account the dissociated counter ions from the charged amino acid residues that also contribute to the screening. And so in effect, we then actually get a interaction potential that in particular at low ionic strength, so no added salt, for example, then makes the potential fairly strongly dependent on concentration. Um, you see here, the example of the kind of colloid potential that we then use for the analysis of the data here. 
Um, and the dashed line here is without the additional attraction and the solid line is then the full potential that also takes into account the short range attraction. Both at a low ionic strength, um, coming just from the buffer itself and, and no added salt, and the higher ionic strength with an additional 50 millimolar sodium chloride added. Now, the question then is, is this type of potential capable of reproducing the experimental data that we then get from the four techniques that I have mentioned? Um, and there are lots of lines and lots of data here. Let's just walk through this. So let's start with the uh, static light scattering results here. The, the, the solid black points are the measured data set from uh, the low ionic strength sample. So looking at the S of CO, the osmotic compressibility as a function of concentration all the way up to very high concentrations of close to 200 mix per mil. The blue um, solid symbols are the same data at 50 millimolar added sodium chloride. So uh, altogether uh, 57 millimolar ionic strengths. And the solid black and blue lines are the corresponding results from uh, colloid theory where we calculate um, uh, the static structure factor and the compressibility to a liquid state here using uh, what is called a, um, a Rogers Young closure that is known to be particularly accurate also at high concentrations. And we see that indeed our data is almost um, um, quantitatively reproduced over the entire Q range. The dashed line here is the, the is it's the same calculation for a potential that only includes um, excluded volume effects and, and screen coulomb repulsion, but no attraction. And this dotted red line here is for a pure heart sphere uh, system here. So you see indeed uh, we need some attraction uh, in order to cover all uh, concentrations um, um, measured. On the other hand, here uh, on the right upper corner, you see the results from the dynamic light scattering experiment. Again, the lines mean the same and the data points and colors also mean the same. So black is low ionic strength, blue is high ionic strength. And the solid line is a full calculation where we use the pair correlation function as we get it from the Rogers young uh, closure relation calculation and then calculate the high dynamic function for this particular case. And again, here we cannot do this up to very high concentrations because of the fact that this approximation that we use here is not valid at concentrations higher than about 50 mix per mil. Um, and so again, things look good. Um, the full structure factors are also nicely reproduced um, by the Rogers Young closure for these two concentrations shown here at low ionic strengths, 20 and uh, 50 mix per mil. And what I have to say here is we use a colloid model with an effective charge of plus 20. And then finally, the, even the, the, the relative viscosity and its concentration dependence is more or less quantitatively reproduced at the low ionic strength sample um, through a relationship, phenological relationship that is known to reproduce heart sphere data quite well. So things look pretty good, don't they? Well, there is, there is a problem here. And, you know, if this were a standard talk, I would stop here. Uh, but I tried to show not only the benefits, but also the problems with this colloid model. And so, you know, there is more to say here, because at the end of the day, what you will see is that we can indeed use this simple um, spherical colloid model to reproduce the data. But we cannot predict it. We cannot predict the parameters of the model that we need to use to, to reproduce the data based on the molecular structure of the antibody. Let's, for example, look at the charges that get out that we get out from, from the theoretical treatment of the data. There are typically three ways on how we determine charges on the antibody, other than also chemical titration, which has its own problems. One is, of course, 
theoreticians or simulators way by 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 really you know calculating amino acid charges using Monte Carlo simulations of the antibody where the uh, the protonation state of the amino acids are allowed to fluctuate and you look over for minimum uh, free energy of the system and then gives you an expected theoretical charge, net charge of the system. But also the charge distribution, positive and negative charges along the surface of the antibody. The standard way um, protein biochemists and chemists um, work is that they measure electrophoretic mo mobility or you know, they normally call it theta potential measurement, even though one doesn't measure the theta potential, but the electrophoretic mobility of a charged particle in an, in an external electrical field, and then use a colloid model to deduce the charge. That results then together with the high dynamic properties of, 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 the, of the particle in, uh, in this mobility. And then finally, the way a colloid scientists often deduce charges on their systems is by doing sex measurements, calculate the structure factor, then use these liquid state theories in order to reproduce the structure factor based on an effective charge that they introduced. What are the values for this particular antibody if we do these three different types of, of, of calculations or, or, or predictions? Well, the theoretical charge as we get it out from from the molecular structure and the Monte Carlo simulations um, is, is plus 31. And the kind of, of uh, charge distribution as it's shown here on the inside of the picture. If we do the electrophoretic mobility measurement, analyze it with a, a spherical uh, a colloid model, we get an effective charge of plus 13. And if we analyze the structure factors, we need to use an effective charge of plus 20. So obviously, you know, they, they all differ wildly. And it's clear that we really have to be aware of the fact that all of these is model dependent. And, and the, the question then remains, how, we, how can we obtain and predict charges and their effects on, on antibody stability? Well, there is another problem in the, in the simple colloid model. And that is in the, when we actually look at the structure factor, um, at higher concentrations, we see that we no longer reproduce it with, with the colloid model. The low Q part is fine, the osmotic compressibility comes out right, but uh, the, the, the peak, the nearest neighbor peak is, is vastly um, enhanced in, in, in the theoretical prediction, but it's not present in, in, in the measurement. So clearly we have some deficiency in this, in this simple spherical model, and we need to look at effects of coarse graining on the effective charge and on, on the effective structure factor. So we then made a, a systematic investigation starting from the amino acid representation um, and then going through successive coarse graining steps to uh, come up with Y-shaped beat models and finally with the spherical colloid. We start with the full amino acid representation and, and we also did then uh, many antibody simulations where we now introduce an, an, an effective beat beat potential between beats on different antibodies given again by a screen Coulomb potential and, and the Lena Jones to take care of, of hardcore and short range attraction, front of us attraction. And what we see is that indeed um, at both ionic strengths we can we can more or less quantitatively reproduce the measured structure factor from sex at all the different concentrations um, using the theoretical charge of plus 32. Um, there is some variation that we that we tested in the in the strengths of the uh, you know, the attractive interaction, this epsilon term, that we buried around values that are known to work well for, for the other types of proteins of this amino acid representation. So what is then happening when we, you know, um, in steps uh, reduce then uh, the number of beads. And so we consider here 12, nine, six, and one bead models. Let's first compare the six and the one bead model. You see that already for the six bead model, 
the structure factor at both um, low and high concentration for the low ionic strength is, is, is very well reproduced by the 6P model. At a higher charge, so we need for the 6P model, we need to use an effective charge, total net charge of about 26 compared to the 20 for the 1B model. And you also see that at low protein concentration, the, the, the level of coarse graining doesn't really matter. Uh, but at high concentrations, it does. And if we then go to the nine bead model, uh, things really become quantitative. We can now reproduce uh, all measured structure factors um, with a new, uh, yet still a bit higher uh, net positive charge. And you can see here that indeed the charge that we need to use the effective total net charge on, on, on the model depends on the level of coarse graining. And it sort of approaches the net charge that we get from the initial single molecule uh, simulation on the amino acid level. And so clearly the take home message from here is that charges obtained are indeed effective charges that depend on the model that is used to interpret the data. And moreover, it's the anisotropy that is crucial also for calculating the correct measured structure factor. Um, why does the nine bit model work reasonably well? And why is the charges um, lower that we use the effective charge lower on the one bit model than on the say, for example, nine bit model? We have looked at this by sort of measuring an effective potential of mean force uh, in simulations between two antibodies. Um, on the left bottom, you see a, a movie not on an antibody, but on a, on a more compact protein that I got from uh, one of our collaborators, Marco uh, Polimeni. Um, and so one basically looks at the pair correlation function between these two particles that are allowed to, to move around and rotate. And, and, and based on this, we can then estimate uh, the, the, the potential of mean force. And what you see here is that in particular at low ionic strength, so that's the upper uh, right hand uh, graph, you see that the long range uh, tail of the potential for the one bead and the nine bead model using these different types of effective charges actually more or less overlap. And it's only at, at shorter distances when the, pot the potential start to deviate. And obviously uh, for the one bead model, uh, antibodies cannot come closer than uh, the heart sphere diameter of, of the one bead system, whereas for the two antibody and, and also for the nine bead models, they can of course come much closer until um, the, the minimum distance that they can have is basically something uh, like the, the heart sphere diameter of a single bead. And, and so since in the low ionic strength um, system, the potential is, is long range and fairly repulsive. Antibodies hardly ever approach very closely. And so in, in that sense, what we then see is that we have to choose an effective charge in the one bead model that results in the same long uh, distance tail of the screen Coulomb potential. And that is of course a much lower charge since the charges in this case are all smeared on, on the surface of this non-conducting sphere. On the other hand, um, there is still the need of some attraction also in particular at higher concentrations where distances are shorter because we need to compensate for the too large excluded volume that the, the one bead model has. And, and so um, again, what one needs to realize is that the charges that one gets when analyzing um, structure factors or, or, or compressibility using these uh, one bead colloid models. These are effective charges that very much depend on the model used to interpret the data. And the attraction needed in the one bead model is also not really directly linked to the fundamental attraction, but it, it, it sort of is there to compensate for the too large excluded volume. And so the values in the attractive part only become meaningful for antibodies once we go to a much less coarse grained model. And this is of course in contrast to the much more compact typical pro, uh, um, proteins like lysozyme or uh, gamma crystalline and so forth that people have used 
uh, where we indeed have the charges on, on the surface and, and the, the structure is not so open. And finally, anisotropy is really crucial for calculating the measured um, structure factors. There is one final thing to add here, and that is uh, even for this antibody that is highly charged and, and with a relatively homogeneous charge distribution, still at high ionic strengths, we suddenly start to see a dramatic increase of the viscosity at high concentrations. And this presumably comes from the fact that now at, at, at high concentrations, at high ionic strength, the, the range of the repulsive uh, uh, interaction between like charged uh, spots on, on the antibodies become much shorter. And so patches start to develop and eventually we, we can also start to see cluster formation that then leads to higher um, viscosity. So the homogeneous charge distribution stabilizes initially the map against aggregation and cluster formation. And once we give enough salt, patches develop and, and attractions take over and clusters form and the viscosity shoots up. So that was this, and you have already seen a bit uh, about pros and cons of, of such colloid models uh, that, do, that we can use to interpret data um, for antibody solutions. Now let's switch to another map. Um, and this other map is again, positively charged. It's still a reasonable charge of plus 13, but you see now when we compare the so-called electrostatic isosurface, um, that whereas this is fairly homogeneous and almost, you know, sort of globular spherical for the, the first map that we looked at, for the second map, it looks different. And, and there are actually clear positively charged and negatively charged uh, regions in this particular antibody. And that actually has consequences when we look at the resulting relative viscosity as a function of concentration. Black here are the data taken for the first antibody that we looked at, map one, and blue are the data taken for the second antibody, map two. The open symbols are the ones at high ionic strengths. The solid symbols are the ones at low ionic strengths. And you see that for the first antibody, charges stabilize the antibody against aggregation and high viscosity. And if we add uh, salt, we start to see a much more increased viscosity at high concentrations. Whereas the opposite is true for the second antibody, where adding salt to a high concentration antibody solution decreases the viscosity quite a lot. And so in one case, ionic strength, uh, increased ionic strength uh, seems to destabilize, whereas in the other, it seems to stabilize. And so this made us rethink again, our approach to colloidal modeling for this type of antibody. You see this actually, when you compare data from static dynamic light scattering and microbiology as a function of concentration for this antibody. And at low ionic strengths, we have a clear indication of, of a concentration induced self assembly with both the apparent molecular weight and the apparent hydrodynamic radius increasing. But then at, at, at higher concentrations, interactions take over. And so obviously we need to now include also a possibility for self assembly when we model this particular antibody. So given the heterogeneous charge distribution and the fact that charges seems to destabilize the antibody against uh, self-assembly and clustering. We designed a three-patch model here, um, either in a Y-shape computer model. Uh, um, in this case, it was a, a six-speed model where we had then um, patches B and A type, two B and one A type, where a attractive interaction was then happening between A and B, and B and B and A and A, a were repulsive. And the rest was just excluded volume. And we also used um, a patchy sphere model to which we then applied an analytical uh, wave time theory, so-called uh, wave time theory, that allows us to look at this um, through a simple numerical calculation. The approach in this uh, coarse graining uh, modeling is then that we start with patchy monomers, 
use wear time theory that allows us to um, uh, calculate um, as a function of a uh, of two key parameters the the hard sphere diameter and the strength of the attractive patch patch interaction uh, allows us then to calculate the um, bonding probability as a function of concentration. This can then be plugged in into another uh, uh, polymer theory, so-called hyperbranch polymer theory, that then gives us the cluster size distribution. And in the next coarse graining step, in order to calculate also dynamic properties such as the uh, diffusion coefficient and the viscosity, we then treat clusters again as either hard or, or attractive hard sphere colloids. So how well is wear time theory able to reproduce the measured compressibility? Um, almost quantitatively. You see here this three patch model um, for two different bond strengths here and, and, and the uh, S of zero or the apparent weight aggregation, uh, weight average aggregation number is, is, is almost quantitatively reproduced. We can then use the bond probability as this come as it comes out of wear time theory as a function of concentration, and then use the so-called hyperbranch polymer theory to calculate now the cluster size um, at each of these concentrations. There's no additional free parameter there. And when we compare the analytical cluster size distributions with the ones that come out from patchy Y computer simulations, they quantitatively agree. So we're fairly confident then that the cluster size distribution, the shape of the cluster size distribution makes sense. And we can then use this and now again calculate compressibility um, and, and through the, the, the sort of a hard sphere relationship where we treat the clusters as, as um, repulsive or attractive sticky uh, hard spheres with the radius given by the cluster size. And we see that now indeed, um, once we have fixed um, the parameters in the wear time model, these resulting cluster size distributions are then capable of reproducing both static light scattering data for both ionic strengths, as well as the microbiology almost quantitatively. And also if you use a simple cluster model to calculate the initial structure factors, they also reproduce the structure factors quite well. So indeed, um, when we beef up our, our colloid model, coarse grade colloid models with patchy interactions, this again works beautifully. So I think it's time to conclude and let me just run you through some of the, the, the major take home messages that I would like to convey to you uh, when we talk about the use of color models to, to deal with complex antibody solutions. First of all, I think it has become clear from what I said um, that individual techniques such as dynamic light scattering or static light scattering or rheology or saxosense alone don't provide conclusive data or assessing aggregation propensity or predict the nearest transition. I, I think this it's fair to say that this is not enough. And, and we really need complementary techniques. The analogies to colloids and using the existing theoretical framework from colloid physics allows us in principle to understand, model, and predict the onset of aggregation and the location of a nearest transition in and I said in principle. The problem here is that we have to be aware of the fact that the predict is difficult because um, since, these, since the parameters that we then need in this colloid description are effective parameters and we cannot just take the molecular structure and, and then predict the parameters that are needed like the effective charge. And so we have to include shape anisotropy and patch interactions if you really want to go from the molecular structure um, to all the measured quantities. It's really the combination of SACS or SANS, SLS and DLS, microbiology and computer simulations that we believe is vital to understand concentration effects on diffusion and rheology of different antibodies. I, would like to particularly point out, since charge is a very important parameter determining the stability of antibodies in solution, um, 
antibody charge and charge distribution is essential for stabilizing monomers in many cases and preventing cluster formation and phase separation. But it has to be clear that simple colloid models together with the experimental tools that one uses to determine charges like electrophoretic mobility measurements or structure factor measurements, they only yield effective charges. Um, and they are different from the actual net charge as it would come out of a titration experiment or in particular from computer simulations uh, based on the full molecular structure of the antibody. And so color models are great, but we need to design them appropriately by first looking indeed at the molecular structure, looking at possible charge heterogeneities that determine um, in the repulsive or attractive charge charge interactions. We need to look at a the presence of possible hydrophobic patches that will not be covered by long range uh, repulsive uh, uh, interactions between antibodies. And so we need to combine molecular and uh, colloid viewpoint. And it's only the link between the molecular structure and the resulting stability and dynamics on all relevant lengths and timescales that uh, can come out of this if we really make this marriage between um, the molecular and the colloid viewpoint. With this, I'm through, um, and I would like to thank those that did all the work. Um, uh, there are a couple of experimental postdocs, Alessandro Goulot, Sam Lenton and Nicholas Kargislinge, um, as well as um, our simulation friends, uh, Marco uh, Polymeni uh, here in Lund, but also um, uh, the more senior uh, PIs, Mikhail uh, Lund, Anna Stratner. Um, there were collaborators from Rome um, with, uh, around Emanuela Zaccarelli, and we had um, industrial scientists from Novo Nordisk and Sanofi that were also um, participating in some of the studies that I presented here. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you.